Thanks for joining us for this special preview. And now, a feature presentation. Welcome back to Matt Presents. The word I was looking for last week was raunchy. I, or maybe sleazy, but I think it was raunchy. I, I'm like, what's, what's the word for sexy, but not, not like attractive? Raunchy. Raunchy is the word I was looking for. So, sort of a stream of consciousness triple feature. Uh, the only thing the first movie and the last movie have in common is the second movie. So, we'll start with the first movie. It's Eating Raul from Paul Bartel. Uh, Paul Bartel, of course, uh, part of Roger Corman's crew in the 70s. Uh, and I think those guys deserve a lot of credit. It's, it's Paul Bartel, Joe Dante, and Alan R. Cush are the three big ones who were working with Corman in the 70s. And th there were a few others that came in and out in the 70s. And I, I think those three really pioneered what we think of as, like, horror comedy nowadays. Like, there were comedic... There, there were, like, comedic movies with horror elements to them, like uh, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein before that. Corman start of start, sort of started it in the 60s with stuff like Bucket of Blood and Little Shop of Horrors, and Paul Bartel, Joe Dante, Alan Arkush really paved the way for for modern horror comedy. Eating Raul is not quite a horror comedy. It's more of a dark comedy. It is still about murder. Um, but it's fun. It's a fun little movie. So if you're a longtime viewer of the channel, you might remember in my second ever video, uh... Chopping Mall. The second movie I ever reviewed was Chopping Mall. And Paul and Mary Bland from this movie appear in that movie. But I hadn't seen this movie at the time. And, uh, I sort of fucked up in that episode. Because there was a married couple in it, and I was trying to find what the married couple's name was on IMDb. And Paul and Mary Bland were the only married couple listed in the credits. Only two people with the same last name. So I assumed, like, the main characters in that movie that were married were Paul and Mary Bland, and I was wrong about that, and in the next episode, I stepped in to correct myself, I'm like, whoops, turns out Paul and Mary Bland are characters from a film called Eating Raul, and I sort of joked that, like, wow, if their jokes in that movie are as good as this movie, it's probably a great film. Because their jokes in Chopping Mall were not good. Chopping Mall was not good. But, honestly, if there were one review I would do entirely different now, it would be the Chopping Mall review. Like, even, like, Giant Gila Monster, there's stuff in it that I will stand by. Chopping Mall, I would do completely differently. So, I, you, this is sort of my penance for, for the jokes I made about Eating Raul not being that good, because Eating Raul is really good. It's a really good movie, I really like it. I'm so happy there's a Criterion release of it, because again, it's one of those things that sort of goes against the idea people have of the Criterion collection, because it's a movie about, like, murder and sex. In fact, uh, I, I went out and got this just for, just for this movie night, because, it, you know, it was like, Barnes & Noble's 50% off sale, and I knew I was going to show Eating Raul, so I'm like, eh, fuck it, I'll pick up uh, the Criterion, because I did have the DVD previously, and I will probably be selling this afterwards, but I didn't want to hold on to it, show it to you. Uh, on the back, the quote is, a very funny movie about, a very funny comedy about sex and murder, which... That sounds right up my alley. That is exactly the type of shit I love. So yeah, I had the DVD, but I went out and got the nice Criterion Blu-ray. And it's got the, the little insert as a menu for Paul and Mary's Country Kitchen. Uh, which is the name of the restaurant they open in the film. I love this. They have the, the big wieners are the best advertisement from the movie. You see it on like a billboard in the movie. 
And that's an official Criterion release. Uh, Eating Raul is the story of these two very boring, very plain uh, middle American family living in Los Angeles. They're trying to start a fancy country restaurant and they don't quite have the money for it. And they live in this apartment with all these crazy swingers and whatever. And one of the swingers is like drunk, comes to the wrong room and thinks uh, Mary is one of the swingers and tries to have sex with her and kind of kind of tries to rape her. And so Paul comes in and hits him with a frying pan and it kills him. So they check they're like checking his checking him for stuff and they find in his wallet he has a lot of money and they find all these swingers just have so much money. So they devise this plan where they they put an ad in the paper like hey the sexy dominatrix come on down. And so they'll, they'll have these swingers come down to, like, have sex with the dominatrix. And the, it's like, oh, yeah, it'll be, like, $300, $400. And then once they get there, they just murder the guy. They were throwing their bodies in the garbage disposal in the, their apartment building. And uh, they get caught by this locksmith who turns out was actually breaking into people's houses. You know, install new locks then come back and break into people's houses. Uh, his name is Raul, the titular Raul. Raul finds these dead bodies, and he's like, look, uh, I don't want to go to jail for being a thief. You guys don't want to go to jail for murder. Uh, just give me the bodies, and I'll give you a cut of the... give you a cut of the money I make off that. Because um, mostly he's selling the bodies for dog meat. For dog food meat. Uh, and he makes plenty of money doing that. He also, like, takes their clothes and thrifts them. And uh, he searches their pockets for their keys and is, like, selling their cars. And he's given Paul and Mary a, a share of that. And then he's like, you guys can keep all the money you're charging them for, like, the sexual services. So that goes on for a while. And... Uh, Raul and Mary, like, Raul is trying to hook up with Mary, and it's kind of working, and then it's just, it's a really funny movie, um, and a really, like, it's, it's my brand of dark comedy, because it's, like, murder and all these crazy sex fiends, and, and, you know, it's a... It's sort of a wild, like, kind of fucked up movie. But at the same time, like, they play it so straight and so simple. It it doesn't feel like a sleazy movie, like a, like a raunchy movie. It just feels like a pretty simple comedy. One of many collaborations between Paul Bartel and Mary Warnov. Um, they were good, good friends. Appeared in a lot of movies together. Paul Bartel, I think, is actually better known as an actor. He did a lot more acting than he did directing. Um, but he has directed a few movies. Um, his greatest movie, of course, Death Race 2000, cannot be beat. But Eating Raul, very close second. Um, I think absolutely deserving of a spot in the Criterion collection. It's it's not, like, I, I sort of said it wasn't, it wasn't in line with what people think of the Criterion collection, but I think it absolutely deserves its place. Like, I'm, I'm not gonna deny that it is not a well-made, uh, like, sort of groundbreaking film. I enjoy it. I enjoy it a lot. Uh, comes highly recommended by me. Apologies for previous comments on this channel where I implied it was not that good of a movie. Moving right along, next up we had Lust in the Dust. A comedy film from Paul Bartel, uh, starring Tab Hunter and Divine. Um, two actors very well known for their work with John Waters. 
In fact, uh, I read somewhere that John Waters was offered this movie, but turned it down because he didn't want to direct something he didn't write. Which is sort of odd. It, it seems weird that they would get John Waters actors in and then get someone else to direct a film with the same actors from John Waters' movies. Uh, but I mean, if they were going to pick anyone to do it, Paul Bartel was a good choice. Both openly gay men, although I don't know if that was the case in the 80s. Both exploitation directors, famous exploitation directors. Plus, I think Paul Bartel's just a good director. Honestly, probably a better director than John Waters. <laughs> I really liked this movie. I did. It was, it was really funny. I don't think it's the greatest. I don't think it's as good as, like, Eating Raul. But it was fun. I enjoyed watching it. A lot of... There's a lot of fun, fun moments, fun, funny jokes. So the story is about Divine. Divine plays this woman going to uh, this like small town in the middle of uh, the desert. I, I guess they don't say where. She's going to this small town, and uh, like she's been attacked by this famous gang of uh, bandits. And she runs into Tab Hunter, and she and Tab Hunter go into town together. Uh, while they're there, Tab Hunter finds out that there's, like, a myth about a bunch of gold in the area, and that there's, like, a secret map to it. And it turns out that the secret map is tattooed... Half of it is tattooed on Divine's ass, and half of it is tattooed on the other lady in the movie's ass. Let me look and see what her name is. Uh, Lainey Kazan. Lainey Kazan? Lainey Kazan, who, uh, plays Margarita, the local tavern owner. Um, they both have half of a map tattooed on their asses. And it leads to, um, like a, a gravestone just outside of town. And that's where all the treasure is buried. And it's, it's this mad dash between all these different characters to try to find the gold... Um, uh, very funny, very, like, it's very funny how they handle it, very funny how they, they do the, how all the characters sort of interact trying to get to this gold, because they'll be, like, all nice to each other and polite to the, to each other's faces, and then, like, when it comes time to get the gold, they're all turning on each other and backstabbing and a lot of, uh... A lot of fun, wild stuff going on. If I had a dollar for every time I'd seen Divine's bare naked ass, I would have three dollars. And that and some change can buy me a Four Locos. So this was put out by Vinegar Syndrome, a uh, popular boutique distributor. I, it's, it's always these fucking boutique distributors. I, I don't plan it, it's just I have a lot of them. I don't think we've gone two weeks in a row without, like, Criterion, or Aero Video, or Vinegar Syndrome, or Shout Factory. It's, it's one of the four. One of the four shows up nearly every week. We barely go two weeks without mentioning them. In fact, I went back and counted. It's like nine out of the 14 episodes so far have included uh, a movie from one of those four distributors. And that's not changing anytime soon. So it's Vinegar Syndrome release, so there's a lot of cool bonus features. I'm, I'm excited to look through those. But it does seem almost uncharacteristic of uh, Vinegar Syndrome. Because they don't usually do comedies. And if they do do comedies, it's usually like, uh, like a horror comedy. They do a lot more horror than they do stuff like this. It's not, like, super out there. It does seem sort of in line with what they've put out, but, uh, it, it is a bit, it, it is a bit odd for Vinegar Syndrome. But, I mean, might be the best film I've seen from them. Uh, hmm. Don't hold me to that, but it might be the best film I've seen from Vinegar Syndrome. I really enjoyed it. Kind of weird to make a Western parody in the 80s. This was, like, 84. The 80s was when westerns were, like, the most dead. Because they died, like, 1974. 1974, after Blazing Saddles came out, 
it was dead. Westerns were dead, and they did not come back until the 90s. So the 80s is like the decade where Westerns were the most dead. So it's weird that they did a Western parody in that era, but... I, I, I don't assume this made much money. It's sort of faded from the popular conscience, even though it is a Paul Bartel film. Paul Bartel has, uh, you know, quite the um, cult following. Um, there is a Paul Bartel film I wanted to see, and I think someone, someone here, right, like, one of my viewers recommended it. It was Scenes from the Class Struggle in Los Angeles, or in, in, yeah, something to that effect. Beverly Hills. The scenes from the class struggle in Beverly Hills. Gotta find my phone, though. So, like, Paul Bartel, he's a moderately well-known director, and yet, and, you know, Tab Hunter, Divine, they've got their cult followings, thanks to John Waters. And yet, uh, this one kind of flew under the radar. Not a lot of people know about it. Which is kind of unfortunate. It's a funny movie. I like it. I Lust in the Dust, it has my full recommendation. I guess this is the first Western I've shown on Map Presents. Which, that's a weird place to start with Westerns. First off, one that came out in the 80s. A comedy, like so like a Western parody. And it's, it's Lust in the Dust with Divine and Tab Hunter. You guys think Paul Bartel and John Waters ever hooked up? I want to believe it. I want to I believe in my head that they did, but probably not. Tab Hunter, of course, was like famous, you know, Hollywood starlet. Starlet? Is starlet women? Is starlet exclusively for women? You know what I mean. He was like the pretty boy, like the, the, the big Hollywood icon pretty boy, and everyone wanted to be with him, you know? And then he started appearing in a bunch of John Waters movies, like, long after his career ended. <laughs> um, and he he lived a lot. He only died in, like, 2018, which kind of surprised me, because his he was popular in, like, the 50s. The 50s was when he was big and famous, and he still lived to 2018, which is longer than Paul Bartel. Paul Bartel died depressingly young. Tab Hunter, of course, was also gay. Not openly so until, like, later in his life. But still, he was, like, legally partnered with the producer of this movie. Uh, they were as married as two gay men could be in the 80s. Um, and, and before that, he had a relationship with... Uh, Anthony Perkins of Psycho. So, just the big gay all around tonight. Paul Bartel, John Waters, Tab Hunter. I guess Divine. Divine was a drag queen. I've, I've been saying she because the character is she. Uh, I, I have looked into it and apparently Divine was like... It, she went in drag and he out of drag... We'll stick with she, because the characters she plays in both these movies are women. So, yeah, Lust in the Dust. I liked it. Uh, it comes recommended by me. I look forward to more Paul Bartel movies in the future. Almost definitely we'll be showing Death Race 2000 on Matt Presents. Like, that's such a great movie. Gotta be shown. And we ended with John Waters' Polyester, which also stars... Uh, Divine and Tab Hunter. Um, this one I think is more fascinating that it's in the Criterion Collection, because it's mainly a parody of, like, uh, All But Heaven Allows, which is also in the Criterion Collection. So I think this might be the first movie in the Criterion Collection that is, at least in part, a parody of another movie in the Criterion Collection. It's, it's just wild to me that there's anything from John Waters in the Criterion Collection. Um, I've got multiple maniacs. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna recommend multiple maniacs someday. Just you wait. But I'll give you a break. We're, we're not gonna do that many John Waters movies right in a row. John Waters had, like, the gross-out phase of his directing, and then, like, the hey-let's-make-real-movies phase of his directing. So, like, on the one hand, you've got, like, 
female troubles and multiple maniacs and pink flamingos. And then on the other side, you've got, like, Hairspray and Crybaby and Serial Mom. And right in the middle, there's Polyester. Because it's not a full-on gross-out movie, but it's also still kind of leaning that direction. So in Polyester, Divine plays this woman whose husband owns a porno theater, and uh, he runs off with his secretary, and her, her son goes to jail for, like, stomping women's feet because he has a foot fetish. Um, that bit was kind of weird. And, and her daughter... Her daughter is teen pregnant, and she's... So she, she like, descends into alcoholism. But then she, she turns her life around, and she meets Tab Hunter, who's this, like, drive-in theater owner. And it's actually, it's actually really funny, because they, like, they go to the drive-in theater, and it's this, like, fancy, elegant ballroom is, like, the concession area, and it's... They act like owning a drive-in theater. Drive-in theaters are so high class. <laughs> drive-in theaters is where John Waters got his start. Like, you weren't going to see pink flamingos running anywhere but, like, the drive-ins and the grindhouses. Yeah, so she starts this relationship with Tab Hunter, who's, like, this nice, classy guy. But then, ooh, it turns out he might have, like, a secret agenda. So included with the Criterion Blu-ray is this, an Odorama card, which, uh, show, which came with the movie when it was in theaters. You get this, and you scratch it off when the numbers appear on screen. I wonder if this works more than once. I did scratch and sniff it along with the movie, and... <laughs> I was watching this over Discord with one of my friends, and I had to, I was, like, describing all the smells to her. Well, one problem with this is, like, the one they show in the movie is a little bit bigger than this, and I think it needs to be a little bit bigger than this, because all of the dots are, like, too close together. So you'll, like, scratch the first one and smell it, and then you'll scratch the second one, and you can still kind of smell the first one. So by the time you get to, like, number ten, it's, like, all these smells are, like, wafting over and you're trying to smell just what number 10 is you can still you can still smell a lot of uh descents on this um and this is basically like john waters found every way to assault you visually now he's finding a way to gross you out with smells because there there's the smell of like because some of them, there's, like, roses and stuff in there, but there's also, like, farts and, uh, model glue. <laughs> like, one of the characters is huffing glue, and it's like, yep, here's what glue smells like. It's like, hmm. I don't really recommend doing this while you're drunk, because it kind of makes you lightheaded. <laughs> it also comes with this nice little poster. It's a polyester poster. And on the back they've got, you know, uh, an essay on... Shit, I can smell the odorama on this. <laughs> an essay about uh, the film. Which comes with every Criterion release. They all have essays about the film. Um, I just like the unique way they package them sometimes. Uh... One of my favorites is Dr. Strangelove. It comes in like a top secret envelope. Hold on, let me show you. Don't you guys love pointless tangents? I get derailed so easily on this show. Top secret. It comes with uh, the envelope, the the, uh, the essays on the, the book, or on, on the movie, and some of the credits for the transfer, and this little... Looks like a magazine from the 60s, and then they got... Is this pages from the script? And something like that. Yeah, top secret stuff. And... A miniature holy bible and Russian phrases. So... Yeah, this is one of my favorite things to come in a Criterion. So anyway... Back to the movie we actually watched. Uh, I thought it was okay. 
uh, far from my favorite John Waters movie. Um, it, Hairspray. Hairspray is my favorite John Waters movie. Because it's like, it's just a good movie. Um, I also really like Multiple Maniacs, though. It's just, I think that one's funnier than a lot of his other gross-out stuff. Polyester, it's fun. There's There's stuff to enjoy about it, but it's not... It's not, like, hilarious, and it's not, like, so over the line that it's, like, a spectacle because of how gross it is. It's like, alright, that was interesting. That was an interesting thing to see as a John Waters fan. Just what what his movies looked like then. I don't know. Uh, if you're into John Waters, I recommend it, but, like... I don't think it's worth seeking out if you're not, like, big on John Waters and and Divine and Tab Hunter. Director approved. John Waters' signature right there. But Eating Raul is not director approved. Because the director was dead when that came out. When the, when the Blu-ray came out. So last time I asked you... Who's your favorite gay director? Because Paul Bartel and John Waters were both gay. Um, and Gregory House said, Joel Schumacher. I sort of thought this was a troll answer. Because, like, not that Schumacher doesn't have some decent movies. He, he has a few decent movies, but, like, he's no one's favorite. Especially because of, like, Batman and Robin. And, and Phantom of the Opera, that's setting him back a lot. But then, uh, Papa Chilo Zapped said his favorite gay directors were John Waters, Chris Butler, and Joel Schumacher. Is there just, like, a really good Joel Schumacher movie I haven't seen? Where if I, if, if I, I haven't seen Lost Boys, I'll admit that much. Is Lost Boys so good that it's worth making Joel Schumacher your favorite director. Uh, John Waters, I get. Uh, Chris Butler, actually, I, I looked it up. He hasn't directed that much. Um, he's more of a writer because he was a he's directed Paranorman, which is good, but I think it's one of the lesser Leica movies and uh, Missing Link, which I have not seen. But he was a writer on Coraline and he was a writer on Kubo. Which are great movies. So, uh, Chris Butler. It, interesting choice. Interesting choice, I will say. Outside the box there. Um, and of course, we talked John Waters. I've talked John Waters more than once. I, I don't know who I'd say my favorite gay director is. Maybe Paul Bartel, because he's like three for four right now. I've seen four of his movies, and I, I liked three of them. Um, I mean... I could go with, like, Gus Van Zandt. Gus Van Zandt's got some good movies. Or, uh... I've only seen two movies from Rainier Warner Fassbender. But they were both really good. Uh, Fox and His Friends and Quirella. Both really good. Or Quirrell. I don't know how to pronounce it. Both really good. So, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Fastbender, maybe, arguably. If I, I'd like to see more of his movies. If I like more of his movies, then maybe, maybe we'll go with Fastbender. But I think I'll stick with Paul Bartel for right now, I guess. Now, a smart man would have thought of a question before right now, but I didn't. So, my question this week is, if you were gonna make your own triple feature, what would be the three movies in your triple feature? Because uh, this week we're gonna watch uh, a triple feature that was not curated by me. We're gonna watch Arrow Video's American Horror Project Volume 1. Um, I've seen two of these three movies, and they were both pretty interesting, so I'm looking forward to this. We're gonna start with... The Witch Who Came From the Sea. We're going to move on to The Premonition. And finally, we're going to watch Malatista's Carnival of Blood. Mal Malatista's is part of the title. It's not 
the director's name or anything. It's actually a character in the movie's name. So, The American Horror Project Volume 1. I think the triple feature, like the whole box set, is out of print. But all three movies should be on Amazon Prime. They were last time I checked. So, The Witch Who Came From the Sea, The Premonition, and Malatista's Carnival of Blood. Uh, and we'll talk about that and the box set next time. Until then, have a nice day.